let's bow in prayer before we open God's word today. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us so much, Lord. Our hearts are filled with joy because of the sacrificial work that you've done on the cross in redeeming us. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing us to yourself. Thank you, God, for the instructions that are given to us in this wonderful book of 2 Corinthians. Um, Lord, as our hearts turn to the text this morning, Father, may you be glorified in what is said. May you speak in my lips, Father, as I speak your word in power. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that uh, you would just uh, fill our hearts and, uh, and just anoint everything that is said here today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we are continuing in this book of 2 Corinthians. And last week I, I talked to you all about how God uh, calls us and he places us where we belong, just like Paul was placed where he belonged in uh, his own Macedonia. You have your Macedonias. Paul had his Macedonia that God called him to. It wasn't an easy calling, uh, but he, uh, he was obedient in that, and God was with him, and his grace gave him strength to do the things that he was called to do in that place. So um, now, uh, one of the biggest things that uh, lay close to the Apostle Paul's heart. We're going to talk about this this morning. Uh, it's mentioned numerous times in the New Testament. What Paul was doing on his journeys, because he'd go from church to church to church, is he would take a collection uh, from the Gentile churches and bring it to Jerusalem. Uh, being the mother church, uh, the Jerusalem church in that day was extremely poor and poverty stricken. So Paul went from church to church ministering. And one of the things he did is he gathered this collection uh, to, uh, to, to be uh, a gift to the, the believers in Israel so that they could preach the gospel and, and effectively spread the gospel from that point. And this brings us to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, I've entitled my message today, The Joy of Giving. So starting in verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they are able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So when we start looking at this chapter, um, we see the Macedonian churches they had been through some very severe trials, such that they were materially left in abstract poverty. So the Macedonian churches weren't exactly uh, flourishing with funding. But yet, despite being materially impoverished, these believers uh, recognized that there were still others outside of their fold that, uh, that needed um, funding as well. And they, 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 were, they were happy they were joyous to be able to be generous with what they had been given by God in order to further the cause of the gospel. And um, Paul brings this up to the Corinthians because the Macedonians ex exemplified the joy that there is in giving and the obedience that they had in serving the Lord in this way. Now it reminds us of the time where Peter, or sorry, where Jesus was with his disciples, I, I should say, um, in the temple. Now in, in Mark chapter 12, 40 and 41, we see that Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put into the temple and watched the crowd putting their money, money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins in worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of poverty. She put in everything, all that she had to live on. Now, that's, that's, un, that's quite an example of, of a heart of worship in giving. Um, now, calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in 
more into the treasury than all of the others. So it wasn't the amount that the widow put in, it was her heart in giving. And uh, these Macedonian believers, as well, Paul is saying here, that um, they gave what they were able to give, and Paul tells us they, they gave even beyond their ability, and this act of giving was entirely done on their own accord. It wasn't someone drumming on them to, to, uh, to give what they, they, they didn't have to give or what, they, what was extra that was on top of what they normally would give. There was no prompting. And the New Testament church, we see the New Testament is a church that gives. Um, Paul used the churches as examples. The Macedonian church considered it a privilege to give funding to the service of the Lord's people. And these fundings came to the believers and they brought them as offerings to the church as being God's storehouse. And as a matter of fact, they were urgently pleading with Paul and his ministry team to permit them the honor of sharing in the service to the, to the Lord's work. And this collection was going to impoverish believers in another place. Um, Paul says here, uh, I, I think there was this, a bit of surprise that he, he had when he saw what the Macedonians had done. Um, it was overwhelmingly generous given the circumstances that they were facing. I think it surprised him. It was a work of God's grace, actually. It, it, it all started with them, first of all, giving their hearts in service to Jesus, and then out of God's will, it f overflowed from them in a grace uh, of, of giving, in, in, a, in a spirit of generosity that God filled their hearts with. Now, now, Paul turns his attention to the Corinthians, starting in verse 6, and he says, So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made it a, a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, we, we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So here we see Paul encouraging the Corinthian church that he commissioned title, Titus to travel up to them and see them. And, and it was his desire that they too would experience the joy of giving as the Macedonian brethren were given that opportunity to excel in this, in this grace of giving for the benefit of others. Um, Christian giving uh, does not so much depend upon our material circumstances, it does on our spiritual convictions. The Holy Spirit does a work of grace that gives us this, uh, this, this spirit that's like, I want to give God everything that I am and, and everything that I have actually belongs to Him. So I want a heart of worship to God to give Him everything that I am. And, and that's, that's the spirit at work in the believers in a work of grace. Now Paul speaks to the Corinthians in verse 8 uh, through this process saying, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty might become rich. So Paul uh, brings up Jesus now. He, he's, um, he's like, he's, he's, he's saying, I'm not commanding you guys to do this, but this is a litmus test on where your heart is. You know, like, like when, when a person gives, it's often a reflection of what's going on inside of their heart in, 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 in uh, thankfulness to God. And he says it's a, a test of the sincerity of their love. Um, an earnestness in being a giving person is a work of God that happens when, when the Lord is given the throne of the heart and, and, and a person casts them down, down before Jesus and says, Jesus, take everything that I am, everything I have. It belongs to you. That, that translates in how a person carries themselves in everyday living. Now, Paul uses this example of Jesus this Christian giving, you see, like uh, giving flowed from the heart of Christ to all of us, uh, he, it flows from the heart. Consider the position of Jesus. Jesus was rich. Um, you know, his sacrifice for the benefit of humanity uh, in need of a Savior did not begin on the cross. It didn't even begin at his birth. 
It, it began in heavens, in the heavens, in eternity past, when the King of the universe decided that he would create this race of people that would have a choice to love him and to serve him. He'd give them uh, this this spirit that was, uh, uh, you know, a reflection of his spirit, because he he desired to have fellowship and 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 a loving relationship with the people he created. Therefore, he gave us this freedom of choice, knowing full well that the fall would come, knowing full well that people would choose to, to, to turn away from him and to reject him and to, and, to, and to go their own way. Yet the Son of God, in all of his, his glory, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And why did he do that? He did that. He became impoverished. He was born in a feed trough, in a lowly stable in Bethlehem. He came to, to, to save the rich and the poor and everyone else in between. He came out of, out of ab, absolute riches in glory. I, I don't think we can comprehend how wonderful it is in the throne room. I don't think we can comprehend how much Jesus decided he loved us so much that he would give that, uh, that, that, that right to receive that, that glory without ever being removed from it, to be born in humble circumstances and to allow the very creation that he made to mistreat him. Why? Because he knew this was the only way for salvation. He knew it and he planned it from eternity past. Jesus was the example of one who had it all and yet was absolutely generous to his last drop of blood on the cross for us. Now, is this as if Paul was telling the Corinthians, with this tremendous example of generosity of the Lord giving to needy people like us, how then can we hold back on being generous to others when they are in need? This is kind of the theme of what he's trying to say here. So the central theme of true biblical Christianity is that we pour ourselves out for others. It's not a consumer faith. True Christianity is not born of self. It is born of service. It is born of humbling ourselves and becoming obedient to do the work of God. Just as Jesus Christ was humble and he did the work of the Father in heaven. Philippians is, uh, tells, tells the believers, but even as if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. You see, this attitude of Paul, Paul said, Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. Philippians 2.17 outlines this attitude that Paul had he exemplified it, and he encourages the believers to have the same sort of attitude. Pour yourself out on the sacrifice. The sacrifice is what? The people. The people is this pleasing aroma to God. We are sacrificed. We live our lives as a sacrifice of praise to Him. Paul says that he pours himself like a drink offering on the sacrifice. That's exemplifying how we ought to be with one another, too, and how we ought to be with God's body, which is the church. It's his design. It's a beautiful thing, um, living in the grace of God. It's not that you're just living out of guilt or obligation. Uh, there's great joy in giving of ourselves to the Lord. The joy of giving overflows in generosity to meet other people's needs, not just with our finances, but also with our time, also with our gifts and the abilities that God has given us. That is the whole person. The generosity of the Spirit that is born in us by the Holy Spirit is generous across the board. It's, it's joyful. It's, it's not a drudgery. It's, this is why God says He loves a cheerful giver because a cheerful giver in the Lord is, is being used by the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's purpose. And that brings God pleasure. And this is, uh, Paul continues to write in verse 10 saying, and, and here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your compilation or completion of it according to your means. 
For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Now, that testimony of, of, of the widow in the temple, God, God's not asking everyone all the time to give everything that they own to the temple treasury. That's not what he's talking about. That widow just felt uh, she wanted to do this. She wanted to do this as an obligation. Paul's saying that you don't, you don't, you, God's not calling you to give what you don't have. Our desire is not that others might be, uh, is, our desire, Paul says, is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that they, in turn, uh, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. You see, God, as God prospers us, it enables us to give more of what God has given to us. It's not the portion, but the proportion. Not the portion, but the proportion that, that God seeks. It's, it's done in recognition that everything that we have actually comes from Him, and ultimately, it belongs to him. Um, Paul continues this appeal. Um, the exception uh, is that when we give of ourselves to meet others' needs, that there's going to be a time come that sometimes uh, maybe something will happen to us. A and that giving is reciprocated, right? So if, if, I'm, in, if I'm in plenty and I give to, to, to one who is needy, there, there may come a time where I am needy, and if we all have the same heart of the Holy Spirit, the heart of God, towards giving and meeting needs, we're going to recognize the needs where they are, and we're going to give when we see there is a lack thereof. Uh, you know, where there's a lack of whatever it is. Like, if it, means, if it means investing our time and inconveniencing our schedule for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel, God calls us to give sacrificially. God calls us to give of our finances sacrificially to the work of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. The church does the work of God. The expectation is there. Thanks be to God who put it in the heart of Titus, the same concern I have for you. Verse 17, For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. So, yes, God calls the believers to give generously to the church so that the work of Christ can go forward both locally and overseas and, and in the areas around us. But Paul ensured that when they had taken in collection that it was... Uh, well, uh, it, would, it was administered with accountability. The apostle was concerned that nobody accuse him of misusing the funds that had been entrusted to him, and, and that's the spirit of what we need to have today, too. We need to be very concerned with avoiding the appearance of evil. There are people out there that are watching, and how we handle our finances, how we handle all of that is under the microscope. And yes, some people are turned off of Christianity because of people that are in leadership positions that are taking money and spending it irresponsibly on things that are not of God, but are of the flesh. And the world takes notice and it turns people off. And I, Paul does not want Christians to be a stumbling block. He doesn't want Christian leaders to be a stumbling block. No Christian or local church should ever send financial support to an unbusiness-like uh, uh, manner, uh, an unbusiness-like handled ministry. I believe this with all my heart. It's important that the church be transparent with the affairs that it conducts to avoid the appearance of evil. Um, there's a, a Dr. Warren Wearsby who says this. He says it this way. When it comes to handling funds entrusted to the church, there should be no opportunity for accusation either from God or men. 
It isn't enough for the Christian worker to say, God knows my heart. We must remember that men are watching us and we dare not give the enemy any opportunity to accuse us of dishonesty. Some people say the local churches are unspiritual if they keep records and issue receipts and have organization. But nothing is further from the truth. Uh, no, no Christian or local church should ever send money to works that are not financially sound. Uh, I want you to hear this. There's a lot of people asking for money out there on the internet. Don't send money until you research what they're doing with their money. A lot of people have been taken in by this and, and their hearts are good, but we need to have sound financial management when we give offerings out there to those in need. We need to make sure we're, we know where that money is going. And uh, God calls us as a local church, Hillside Community Church, to be, uh, to be accountable to Him, to make sure that we're transparent in how we conduct our business and how we show where our money is going. That's why we have business meetings. That's why we have membership. That's why we have to have this structure. Um, it's a structure that we've chosen. We could have chosen a different structure in another culture, I guess, but that's what we do in this culture to keep ourselves accountable. And I would encourage you to be accountable with your finances. Romans 14, uh, you, you know, it, it's not that money is everything. It's not, okay? Money is given to us by God to use for His kingdom purposes, for His glory, to, to do things, to do good in this world. Um, but, but the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Romans chapter 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But... When God gets a grip on our heart, He gets a grip on our pocketbooks, and He also gets a grip on our schedules and what we do with our time and how we invest our lives. You know, um, I, in North America, there's this kind of kick up your feet and click the, click the remote kind of approach to Christianity. And that's not God's, that's not God's design. Yes, it's good to be edified and built up by, by ministries that are out there that are proclaiming the gospel and teaching ministries that are encouraging us in the faith. That It's really important, but there is a purpose for the body of Christ to meet together, to put feet on the ground, to, to, to distribute uh, uh, the gospel into the corners of our community and for missionary ventures to be on the ground. It's, it's not a matter of, of just receiving a tantalizing message. It's a matter of having that message transform our hearts so that we walk in a way that Jesus would have us to walk. That's what God's purpose is. And in, in, in multimedia and all this stuff that's, that's out there, it's great as long as it translates into us walking out what we're learning. You see, God doesn't just want us to come to church to sit there and to absorb. He wants us to come to church to be equipped, equipped to take the gospel to a world that is lost and needs to hear the truth, needs to hear the love of Jesus. Now, some believers are extremely generous. And God bless you. Oh, man, I, I, I've just been overwhelmed. You know, by the, by, the, by the generosity of the people of God here. You know, I, I remember when we first started here, I think we had 25 people, and we have a large property, and our budget's fairly high. Those people, those initial people that we started out with here, they gave, they gave from the depths of their being. And, and, and sometimes we didn't know where the next uh, dime was going to come from. And God just supplied. Thank you for giving to the Lord. This is a, an act of worship as God has given you the means to be able to support the kingdom work. And, and our prayer is that we'll be able to be a giving and ascending church. I don't just want us to be a church that sits in a, in a, in a back eddy. No, we need to be a giving and ascending church that Jesus Christ is coming soon. The time is short. The harvest is white. And we need to get out there. We need to do the things that God has called us to do to take His gospel to those that don't know. And that means increasing our missions giving. I prayed when I first started here that we would be able to triple our missions giving. That happened. I'm praying again. God, give us, give us the ability to triple our missions giving. Get, help us in the next year to triple our missions giving. I pray that. And, and the only way that's going to happen is if we grow both in, in, uh, in, in giving, but also in numbers. So I, I pray that, that you would just share the gospel, 
with people out there. We need to see a wave of salvation in this town, amen? We need to see people saved, delivered, and healed from the oppression of the devil. We've had a coronavirus uh, uh, hit that has been unparalleled in our living memory. We don't know of anything that's been like it. And it's given us an opportunity to speak into the lives of people that, that realize that, uh, that, that, that society is broken. They're broken. They need something. They need Jesus. Oh God, give us vision. Give us uh, ambition as well. And, and if God puts something on your heart to do it, put your hand to the plow. Come talk to me. We'll figure it out. We'll do it. Um, my, 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 my prayer is that every person would find a place to fit into the, <coughs> pardon me, the body of Christ here and, and function in the way that God's designed. Not in the way that God hasn't designed. Some of you have different gifts than, than others. But God has given each of you a gift to invest in the kingdom. So, if all of God's people were to give generously to the church in proportion to what God has blessed them with, and if those entrusted to carry the funds given, carried those funds responsibly and acted as though those funds actually belonged to God, which they do, then we could do incredible things. Can you imagine what we could do for the kingdom of God if everyone gave from the depths of the joy of their salvation? Imagine. In all ways. Uh, God's kingdom... Would, would, would there be a revival? <laughs> you want a revival? This is, this is a revival. If, if we actually humbled ourselves before God and said, God, I give you everything I am, everything I have that belongs to you. How would you want to use it, Lord? How would you want to use me in service for you? We, we have that mentality. There would be revival. The Spirit of God would fall on this, on this place. And, and we'd see people get saved. And that's what we need to see. In addition... Paul says in verse 22, We were sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. So it just wraps it all up, what we're saying here, right? And as was the case with our Lord Jesus and also with the early churches, there's no difference today. Generosity to the work of establishing the Christian community, both here and abroad, is rooted in God's grace. It's a work of God's grace. It's given to us by the Holy Spirit when we bow before Him and we say, take it all, Lord. Take all of me. This, is, this overflow of true Christian generosity is... Uh, as Albert Barnes puts it, he says, it's not a plant of native growth in the human heart. It's not something that naturally we will want to do. It is a work of God, a work of grace that stirs it up within us. In our flesh, we want to cling to what we have and we want to create walls around ourselves to protect ourselves. The gift of Christ was to open himself up, even if that meant that he was uh, persecuted for doing so. <laughs> but guess what? The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of Jesus gives us the strength to do the things that God has asked. And that's what God wants us to have. Joy for living collectively and individually as we live in his grace, as we soak in the touch of the master's hand because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Could the music team come forward? Jesus, we just want to thank you. Lord, you are worthy of all praise, glory, honor that we can give you. You're worthy of our lives, Father of our resources, of our time, of everything that we are and everything that we have, Lord. It's all yours. Lamb of God, we fall before you. You are worthy. We're going to sing that song in closing today. And I just pray that you would make your life a prayer to Jesus today. And I don't know, I mean, everybody's in different circumstances. Whatever it is that God's prompting you in your heart, just let him be the guide. And um, let him 
let him speak and, and re rearrange things in you if necessary. We all need that, right? Life is difficult and sometimes we, uh, we look at the wrong things and it's easy for us to get off track. But Jesus is worthy. Amen.